I changed this live Q&A from Thursday to Tuesday this week because I'm on the road and um, as I checked into my what the Wi-Fi situation is on Thursday it sounds terrible so I thought since I happen to hit good Wi-Fi here at this campground that I just pulled into <clears throat> I thought I'd just do it today and um, I'm gonna post it so you'll all have access to it so I'm gonna see if Charlotte is actually here since that is who is asking the questions um, before my nose blew. And these little light dots are <laughs> little little strings in my curtains. Anyway, <clears throat> that's the lighting I have. We're doing very low tech, so watch me eat the dots. <laughs> anyway, oh my God. Okay, so, oh, hi, Linda. Cool. Um, I wonder if I can see where you guys are. I'm on my phone, obviously, so I'm not sure how to see all the comments unless they just show up. I think, let me see if I can wave. Oh, oh that good. Okay, I just waved. Um, so I'm just going to talk about um, Bluebell. And the reason I want to talk about Bluebell is because Bluebell freaked out at her first trial and um, about the measuring. And these dots are very distracting. So let me see, move myself over here. So let me get to the question about Bluebell. I hope I don't have any blood on my face. <laughs> Just had a major nosebleed. I get those in dry weather when I eat spicy food. Let's see, is it gonna go again? Uh-oh, might be starting. Um, and hot tea. So I had some, a spicy kind of salad followed by tea. I may not be able to finish this. Ah, if this is the case, I won't even post this. What a mess I am. So, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna find, I'm, Bluebell freaked out about being measuring. There were a bunch of people around, dogs around, and she was raising her lips and the judge was afraid of her. And so of course that freaked um, uh, Charlotte out as it would anyone, rightly so. So the first thing I wanted to say is trials are really unnatural for dogs. And everything about it, right? They could be in the ring and other dogs are staring at them or other dogs are barking and they may not be barking at the dog in the ring, but you know, an intense barking. Um, there may be dogs tugging wildly with their people while staring in the ring. Um, and it may cause you to have to go through really tight quarters with your dog to get to the ring or you might be running late and then you're all rushy and you're, you know, you know, get the leash on really quick and get your dog out and your dog's going, what, 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 what? There's so many things that happen at trials that are unnatural that, um, and that's only made, you know, more difficult because there haven't been trials. So Bluebell hasn't been the puppy at the trial. Just being around, you know, week after week after week, seeing the action, going for walks, doing tricks, all of that. So, um, you know, that adds to what probably freaked her out. But the other component is, um, it sounds like Bluebell's a little bit shy and Lil is a little more than a little bit shy. And I got advice early on um, from, not too early on, from, yeah, I did. When Sue Sternberg met Lil and she saw Lil didn't want to have anything to do with her, she said, that's totally fine. That Lil is bonded with you, she goes to you for support, she doesn't have to meet me. She doesn't have to meet anybody. And I remember going, okay, I'm fine with that. And a few years later, I'm at dog camp. I used to go to Camp Gone to the Dogs, which is the most fun camp in um, Vermont. And I think it's Vermont. Anyway, super fun. If you're on the East Coast, it is pure fun. For two weeks or one week and your dog will gain all the weight because you're doing so much fun training. But anyway, side note. So. A few people had advised me that, oh, I should do the, um, the canine good citizen class with Lil so that she gets used to um, being around people and is exposed to all that stuff because, you know, she still was shy. And Sue, who is a teacher at that camp, an instructor, she said, she was, don't do that, that you can create a biter out of any dog by forcing them to interact when they don't want to interact. And Lil was a little, she was maybe a year, or maybe she was nine months. Actually, if it was camp in the fall, she was about nine months. 
cold. So I didn't do that, and I took Sue's advice. I thought, you know what? Lil's want to meet people. I certainly don't want her to become a biter. So I just let Lil be Lil. And over the years, she started coming out of her shell a little bit. I mean, just to give you perspective, when we took her to puppy class, it was kind of an out of control bad puppy class, where puppies of all sizes um, were, you know, running around as part of the class. And Lil wanted nothing to do with it. She would just, you know, be under a chair, and then she'd run across the room and then under another chair. Um, she didn't want, you know, to be interacting with the people. Uh, so it wasn't the best experience for her, but it wasn't traumatic either. She did want to climb on all the contact obstacles, though, which is kind of weird because she hasn't even seen them, but another side point. So back to Bluebell. Bluebell sounds like she's a little shy, uh, and she's going to have to get used to being around people, but that doesn't mean she needs to meet people, that she can turn to Charlotte for her support. And like the way Lil would meet people, and, you know, because... If she would like wiggle waggle at somebody, she turned to me and I'd say, good girl, give her a piece of food. So then she started in engaging quickly with somebody to turn around and get a treat. So she learned that behavior as, you know, something she chose to do and she got a reward for doing. With Bluebell, I would do the same, uh, follow the same advice that um, I got for Lil, which is Bluebell doesn't need to meet anybody. She doesn't want to. She doesn't have to get closer to anybody than um, she wants to. And I would treat the trial site with, with, you know, I had this insight today because I was driving 465 miles and I'm in an RV. And so I'm behind a truck that's going 10 miles under the speed limit. And I'm like, okay, do I stay here for hours and not go as fast as I want to go? Or do I stress out a little bit and pass the truck? So, you know, each time I pass the truck and it's a little bit stressful and then I get back in front of the truck I have a certain amount of time that I want to just chill and get over the little bit of stressor I had passing a truck with an RV. So then, of course, I'm catching up to the next truck. And I have that same experience. It's like, okay, you know, do I want to sit behind this slow truck or do I want to go? It's like, well, I want to go a little faster. And if I were getting off of the next exit, I'd be like, oh, I have to stay behind the truck. But so again, I, I, I choose to stress myself out a little bit, pass the truck, and then I give myself a lot of time uh, but before the next passing of the truck. So I may even sit behind a slower truck for, you know, five minutes. I don't know. I, it wasn't timing it. But I just noticed that, wow, I'm modulating my stress. So I'm pushing out of my envelope a little bit, and then I'm coming back down. And the way I see exposing dogs to trial sites, the same routine, where I get to the show site early, and I walk my dogs around. If there's an opportunity to walk around and in between the rings and, you know, that they can just take in all the scents and the sights. And I, you know, it's nose to the ground kind of walking. Um, and it's usually a potty walk at the same time. So I'm just letting them take in the scene before the scene has arrived, really. Just take in the blank environment with just, you know, the ring stuff and a few people usually carrying boxes and timers and stuff like that. And then I'll put them back in the car. And if I have to get a dog measured, I'll go in there and, and ask the judge, you know, when's the earliest you can measure because I want to get my dog measured before all the action starts because he's going to be more amped by that. And judges are like, oh, let me like help you make it easy for me. So they I make sure I've got like the judge's attention that I get to be first. And so my dogs are back in the car recovering from passing the truck, like if it was a passing the truck for them. So, so I'm giving my dogs an opportunity to de-stress before I bring them out the second time. So the second time I'm going to, I'm, there's going to be more people there, right? So I can do the same routine and yet the stress potential is higher for, especially for a young dog that hasn't been around barking dogs or people moving tents and all that. So again, I, you know, and I'm going to walk them close to where the gates are, you know, the ring gates are and and then boom, they're back in the car or in their crates. And I do like to crate in my car. Uh, more than being, you know, inside the arena. Um, you know, I know people think their dogs do better if they're just, they just get used to this activity all day long. My gut for myself is I like to retreat from all the action and de-stress. I want to stay in the right lane. I don't want to always feel like I'm passing or about to pass. Um, it really is the perfect analogy for this. So I prefer to keep my dogs away from the action. Um, 
So now, okay, so my dogs have passed two big trucks. They've gone out, back, out, back. Now, maybe the trial's starting already, and I will bring each dog out separately, and I'll ask for some simple behaviors. And if the dog is, you know, they'll maybe be a little more amped, but I feel like, oh yeah, they're in a really good mental space. I'll do favorite tricks. I'll do movement kind of stuff, back up, heel position, flip to the other heel. All the stuff that they know and enjoy. And because we do these things other places, I know what my dogs should be looking like when they're doing this. You know, they, I know their energy level is going to be a little higher, but overall I can see, is my dog responsive? Are they thinking or are they starting to get worried or amped? Um, again, then boom, dogs go back in the car. And I may walk a course, um, I may take them for a potty walk, a nice big perimeter walk again. So all of this stuff is just giving my dogs little bits and pieces of this environment and then giving them time to process. And I really do love this passing the truck analogy. It was like the road trips are great for, I guess, thinking outside of what you've been thinking about. But um, so then let's say I'm getting closer to my dog's turn. Um, I will take them to the practice jump. If the practice jump is set up in an appropriate place, sometimes like they cram it into a little corner that's jammed, you have to get through like 20 dogs to get to it, and then there's no space to actually work your dog, so that's not an ideal practice jump. But if they have it you know, away from the action, I'll bring a mark bucket, um, I'll work my dog in the mark, I'll you know, recall them over the jump, I'll send them to the mark, I'll do wraps away from the mark, I'll do all this stuff, and again, the purpose isn't to get any performance on my dog, the purpose is to see where my dog's emotional and mental state is. Um, so th by that point, I know what I've got. And if my dog likes to play, I'll be doing play like we do at home again. So I have this comparison. Is my dog like my dog is at home or is it the dog more amped up or nervous or, you know, looking around? And then you know what you're going into the ring with. And you know if you need to lower your criteria for all of the performance stuff because your dog is on the edge of losing, you know, control. You know, mental and emotional control, or if you feel like, gosh, you know, I think my dog's pretty good, and then you, you know, would, you know, expect the maintenance of, um, of, you know, criteria um, within reason. You know, you, you know, what I mean, I think you get that point. So, with Bluebell, the way I would be approaching this, if she were my dog, and I'm envisioning what happened, if I'm envisioning it correctly, that, um, you know, she did was not comfortable being that close to the judge that you know, the people around, dogs around, the whole thing was overwhelming, is I would, you know, be training that um, metal swinging thing. So that's a really bizarre thing for dogs. I'd be training that at home in the easiest environments possible until she was pretty good with it. She doesn't have to be great with it. She just has to be like, oh, that's that thing. And, and I wouldn't make her meet judges. If you have places you can take your, your dog where she can be around judges, um, I would do that. I would not force her to all of a sudden be a, the kind of dog she's not. So she doesn't want to meet people. That's cool. One of the advantages is a dog doesn't want to meet people is going to more likely turn to you than like Dakota, Mr. Happy Dog. He wants to meet everybody. That was um, challenging when we first started trialing. So the other really important thing that's hard to do is to let the dog tell you the timeline instead of going okay I, you know the next trial is in one month and by one month I want you know I'm gonna you know I want to run my dog at that trial and it's a great goal to have especially with so few trials we want to do the ones that are close and available but I would I would really let her um, time the readiness um, for trials because again this is not natural stuff for dogs and it really is easy to train the agility behaviors, but what makes for a successful team is this two-way communication, this two-way trust, um, that everybody's having fun, that it's a game, uh, and the stress is, is being at a level that everybody can tolerate, because trials are stressful for people too. And we know, you know like a certain amount of stress kind of makes you run better, but too much stress and you know, you're screaming because you don't even realize you're screaming, you know, barking your commands and um, you know, you're not reading your dog, you're running the course instead of running the dog, all of that stuff. So 
I hope that makes sense about, you know, like let like doing ocean, observe your dog, you know, break everything apart into tiny pieces. Be around people, but when, you know, Shady looks at a person and orients to you on her own, good girl and you know praise whatever it is you could give her a treat so that she's basically saying hey there's a person there you know I'm with you that's cool so um, and if you want more on this you know if this resonates with other people post in the next Q&A because once the six um, modules of ocean or six or seven however many there are are done that the Q&A's are gonna shift to um, people are gonna be uh, you know, submitting questions like a Q&A, but instead of a Q&A, I'm going to be doing free one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with somebody. So, and I'll pick the topic. It's not based on the person. I'll pick the topic that I think is the most um, interesting to the most people. So, I think this is an interesting topic. I think Shady's, um, you know, over arousal issues. I think that's um, an interesting topic. But you know, so. We're going to shift gears to that, and um, I can get more into what we were just talking about with um, Bluebell. Um, so, and I guess, you know, this goes into this, I did take some notes, as always, that really letting our dogs choose to opt in or opt out, I think it's really important. And even at the most basic level, um, I'm working with my friend Chris and she's a brand new dog trainer and so we're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that will show people who have never done beyond you know sit you know with a dog how you get started with ocean style training um, so that's gonna be you know it's another project that I'm working on the side but no matter what level you're at no matter what level of training your dog is at that the dog has to it, it I believe the dog should always have the choice to opt in or opt out. So, and that includes um, with toys. Like, I know there's a strong tendency to um, teach dogs how to tug, and there's a whole bunch of rules about that the dog shouldn't let go first, that you should end the game, and you know that the dog should bring the toy right back, and you know all these rules. And fine if you have a dog that has issues with you know not bringing the toy back but um, my feeling is yes you can train a dog to tug yes you can train a dog to fetch and it comes in handy you know to be able to throw a reward at a distance to reward your dog at the distance and they need to bring the toy back so yeah it's all good for training but I don't use something that is not rewarding for my dog as a reward until it is rewarding and an example of that is with Dakota as a teeny puppy, he wasn't food oriented at all. So the first thing he learned was when I offer you a piece of this boring kibble, you have to take it. So what was interesting, because terriers are like foodies, like crazy, like, you know, they'll do anything for food. But with Dakota, what I noticed with him is I'd offer food, he would take the food in order to be able to do the next thing we were doing. So what was rewarding was working with me and the food was like the training so I was aware of that and eventually they flip-flopped and now he understands food is the icing on the cake but food is not the big deal it is for a dog like Lil so I didn't think of food as a reward until it was rewarding to him and you know this the same is true with all of our dogs even if we have trained a dog who wasn't naturally toy driven to enjoy play that to really get in touch with is this a reward to my dog that is appropriate for the work that he's doing or she's doing before I gave her this reward or is it now we've trained this this thing and I think I'm rewarding my dog but really what I'm doing is now training or re, you know re, reinforcing another behavior I've trained which is the play with the toy so I, I hope that makes sense because I see a lot of people rewarding their dogs with toy play and the dog is going you know yeah eh, and the person's you know it, it, it's not a reward um, so how that relates to Bluebell is that the dog has an opportunity to opt in or an opt out dog does not need to meet anybody and in terms of measuring until my dog is willing to hop up on a table at a trial site and let me swing 
that metal thing and touch them on the back, jump up and down the table like you know five times in a quiet arena, I wouldn't even consider getting it measured. I just, it's, it doesn't make sense to pile on all the stressors on top of something that the dog is, it's unnatural for the dog and the dog has to first be able to do the, the weirdest part about it, I think. And you know, there are some venues that don't use the swinging metal thing. Um, I know Nadek is one where they just have this PVC U shape and the dog just stands there on, I think it was even on the ground, it could be like on the cement and the judge just puts this U thing down over the dog's back and if it doesn't hit the dog, then that dog measures under whatever that's, that thing, that I think it's called a spigot or something or something like that. So if you really want to run your dog and you have Nadek around, you could always, um, you know, just keep doing the training for the terrible metal swinging thing and, um, and keep, you know, just let Bluebell know she doesn't need to meet anybody, but people are around and to let her, you know, realize that you've got her back. So I hope that makes sense about Bluebell. And Shady, I'm going to touch on briefly, but Shady is going to be better for, to talk about this, going to be better for um, one of you guys who has an over-aroused dog to pr prepare a, I don't know, up to a four-minute video that shows what happens to show your dog starting off in a really good working state and then going, you know, into the over-arousal state, what that looks like, and then what if there's a way that you have found that you can modulate your dog at all, or if not, that's okay too. So that's a really common issue and it will be interesting because I think what's going to happen is when you try to videotape your dog doing the thing, your dog's probably not going to do it because you're paying such close attention to it that you're responding to the early signs or the dog just realizes something is different and they're not going to go over the top. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you'll be able to get it the first take, but my guess is that you're going to be doing the stuff that normally makes your dog go over the top and your dog's just going to be perfect. So, so we'll see how that goes. Um, wickets. Thank you. Not spigots. <laughs> Measuring wickets. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, it's, I mean, if you really think about a trial, it is just insane, right? For social animals that they're doing all this body language if you, you know, have a group dogs just hanging out together. And in trials, you know, we, we, that's all missing because everybody's engaging with their dogs and getting ready and, or not paying attention to their dogs because they're staring at the course or there's just, we're too close. We're, you know, we're pulling our dog like immediately, like, oh, we're late, they call my name, and then you know, boom, we're in the ring, and then we're feeling all, ah. There's so much that's, that's not like what our dogs are used to. It's actually amazing they're willing to do it at all and do it as well as they do it. So the, yeah, the trialing is a whole thing that is, I think, 10% um, training of the obstacles. <laughs> the rest is the environment, and I think also, it's probably 90% us being able to maintain our equilibrium and keep ourselves, you know, coming back to being present for our dogs. I, this is this is big, and I'm glad I'm, I'm getting onto this topic. That at trials, we're out of our minds a lot. We're talking to people. We, we after our runs, we want to like ask somebody like, "Why did my dog do that?" Or you know, you know, was my handling this or my handling that? But um, I think Ocean, by doing this thing for you know six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, as we keep going forward and adding more and more complexity to this, that you're just gonna get in the habit of when you are engaged with your dog, that you're gonna stay engaged with your dog. And you may glance up and look at the part of the course and make sure you've got it memorized, but you're gonna go right back into this engagement with your dog. And so, really through the time frame of ocean the reason it's again not a you know three-day seminar it's a long-term program is that these habits take time to put into place and I know that I stay very connected to my dogs um, I don't expect them to sit and do nothing while you know I'm paying attention to other things and I have seen a lot of people do that so this is one more topic I want to touch on some dogs naturally 
do nothing um, because that's who they are. My dogs tend to be pretty active when we're going towards the ring. And a terrier, if I leave her to do whatever she wants, she's just gonna be sniffing around. She's probably gonna be marking. So I don't want sniffing, I don't want marking before we go in the ring. I want more of an engagement, so we are connected. Um, so with Lil, I'm you know playing little you know pawn shake games and doing stuff and not continuously, but I want her to you know be my teammate then. And with Dakota, until recently, I needed to keep him engaged so that he didn't become stressed or anxious about loud barking dogs. That got him amped, and I noticed well, there's been less loud barking dogs at this one site, so we'll see how he does if they all emerge again. But at the last trial site, the trial I went to, he was able to completely relax, like just laying down in the grass, and I didn't need to do anything with him because he was like the dog I have in my backyard. And I thought, great, he's in a great mental space. And I don't feel the need to rev up my dogs before run. I want them engaged with you know teamwork, and I want kind of bright eyes. And so with, you know, with Lil, she's in that state. And the same with Dakota. I don't want him like, you know, like going to sleep. But I don't feel like I need to get my dog ready, 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 ready before we go in the ring. Because usually just entering the ring, the ring itself has an association that that revs them up enough. So that's one more little side note. Um, so, and here's one other thing. Okay, so some dogs naturally are willing to wait. They're just doing nothing. But there are some other dogs that look that and the reason they're so still and doing nothing is because they've had a couple of harsh corrections for doing other things. And this might surprise you that I don't have like this, you know, oh, I would never blah, 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 you know, I harshly correct my dog, you know, jerking on the leash. Um, that isn't my style. I don't personally do it. But if one of those does the trick for a dog for life and you get a dog that best, I, I guess it doesn't bother me the way I would think it would bother me. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, the jerk, 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 jerk. So I have just noticed a couple of um, handlers that have these really mellow dogs um, that explode from the start line, uh, mellow outside the ring, and they're very still, I think, um, and I have seen them do leash pops. So. Uh, you know, it can work. I, I don't, it's just not me. I can't do it, but um, I don't know why I share that. That's not really what I would do. But I guess I'm saying I'm not this, you know, purely everything's positive, always positive kind of thing because going back to Shady, and I am a little bit all over the place because I've been in the car all day, so I hope this is okay. But um, as Charlotte was describing what Shady was doing, Shady seems like she's crossing some lines. And so like, I'm not gonna want my dogs in front of me barking and taking the space that I'm trying to move through. And as women, we all have this tendency when we're taking our dogs for a walk, we walk, if our dog stops moving, we walk around them. But if you don't walk around them, if you just kind of gently push through, the dogs learn that, hey, everybody's walking here and yet, if I'm not paying attention, if I'm not, I will then naturally step around just like you do a person on the street. So I think there's something to be said about giving dogs the body language, and it doesn't have to be harsh, that said, you know, that, hey, I'm walking this way, you're now in front of me, and I'm just gonna keep moving my legs. And I'm not talking kicking, I'm talking moving forward through that space that is my space because I think the dogs know that that's the direction you're walking and they're trying to control that space. So I think there's something really good in terms of thinking about your relationship with your dog and then, I mean, we're giving them all this respect, right? And I think it's fair to expect a certain amount of respect back in a way that a dog understands respect. So they do understand space. And like, for instance, if my dog came charging in front of me and bit me, I would consider that to be like some guy grabbing me hard by the shoulder and manipulating me. And I wouldn't accept that from um, a man. And I don't think we should be accepting it from dogs either. 
and we're not doing them a favor. It's like, you know, you've got Helen Keller reaching all over, didn't know anything. She didn't know there was a, a boundary. And once she learned the boundary, she stopped doing it. Um, it was an obscure reference, I know. <laughs> but the same, I think dogs will accept these kind of boundaries. So if Shady is charging into the front of your space, Charlotte, and you were walking, I would maintain that same stance. I would just walk right through her. And for me personally, if, if my dog bit me, out of high arousal or anger or anything other than like this ooh mistake I thought you know there was a treat and I mean that doesn't really happen because I have another story about why I don't get bit in the hands but um, I would not be um, I think I would actually grab the dog by the collar and I would be really like you know in a mean like no no and I would be leaning over them, I'd be like, you don't, you no, know, you don't do that. I would be very firm about that, that they are not acceptable. So um, definitely think about that, Charlotte, because, you know, I see a lot of dogs that get into this habit, these herding dogs that come back in when they get frustrated, they come back in and they, what they're doing is not high-fiving. They are being kind of jerks and I don't know. I think, you know, we can tend to be too nice and, or what? I don't know. I do, I am not opposed to drawing a boundary with a person or a dog. And, you know, my dogs don't do that. And I wonder if the reason they don't is maybe they know that they can't. I don't know, or that's, maybe that's just not their style. But, you know, occasionally Dakota will do like a, I'll call it a little punch with a foot. He'll hit me kind of hard. And I, I let him know that, oh, you know, nah, that's not good. He's like, it's like he doesn't know what to do and he'll kind of like pop me with a, a, a leg. Um, so I guess he is testing a little bit or something, but um, he's never, he's not coming at me with his mouth. Although, you know, you never know, right? They're dogs. <laughs> so I'll let you know if he ever does what I did and how it worked out. Um, so Charlotte saying, okay, shady being ornery, yeah. And if any of any people who watch this video or are watching it live, if you've had this experience with a dog, please share about it. I wanna hear um, what worked, what didn't work, and I think we'll all learn a lot because I have not had that issue with a dog, um, you know, biting me or being in any way like aggressive or Kind of disrespectful of me. I mean, Dakota's jumping up was always like, you know, goofball, like, you know, you know, I'm going yay with my hands and he's going yay with his hands. So it was a different motivation and a different energy. Um, let's see. So those are the questions. And sorry, this is so loosey goosey. Um, no, Shady isn't coming at me with her mouth, just barking at me and jumping around. So have you ever walked through her, just kept going in the direction you're going and kind of bumped into her and, and see how she responds to that? I mean, one thing I saw Sharon Nelson do at a, at a seminar that um, there was a dog that was coming in to the, the handler and biting. And Sharon had, after the last obstacle, that's when it would happen. And Sharon had that handler just run straight I don't remember, not at the dog, but straight across some line where the dog was, I don't remember the geometry of the whole thing, and the person did not want to do it. Um, but when the person did it, the dog went, whoa! You know, the, the dog instantly responded, and yet for, it was so uncomfortable for the person, I, I know why. It's the same reason we all veer around when our dogs stop instead of, you know, like kind of pushing through them so they, you know, you know pay more attention. So, um, and Charlotte's saying habit, yes. Habit for, for Shady, it's gonna take you a while to get in the habit of um, moving through. I mean, we women, we are way too polite about that. You know, if, if somebody bumps into me, I'm always like, sorry. <laughs> uh, and you know, on walking down crowded streets, you know, I'm always working around everybody. It's just the nature, I think of, um, I don't know, a lot of women are like this, I think. So actually, let's all consider this, that when we're taking our dogs or just walking out to the practice field together, 
how about this? We all the challenges to pay attention and to make sure that we are owning our own space. And I'm going to start, um, I'm going to post about that in case this becomes a great topic of conversation, which it might be, especially on leash that, you know, that when you're walking two dogs and, you know, that to really pay attention to, you know, are we walking, you know, giving each other a reasonable level of respect about the walk. So, or is one dog kind of dominating by always pulling behind, holding off, you know, needing to sniff every little thing, or is one dog, you know, veering off to the right and forward, or is one dog constantly right under your feet? I've had that problem, not recently, but I remember, I can't remember which dog it was that would constantly almost like taking me out. So, okay, that is, I'm gonna post that as a topic, and I'm gonna also post the next Q&A where you can ask your questions. And like I said, I'm really excited about um, where we're gonna go after the weekly q and A's to shift to these one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. And I'm gonna post a couple of examples um, when I can about what, what a coaching session looks like so that you all can um, understand they're really, it's a natural way of interacting. It, I didn't anticipate it being this great that you know, you submit a video and then we have this conversation via Zoom about the video that we are all watching. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way that with my friend Chris that other topics came up that were fantastic. And the reason we finally did that is we kept having conversations on the phone and then she'd say, oh my gosh, we should have been recording this. And I'm like, yeah, this is really good stuff. So we started recording and we're gonna record every single one. So um, I'm looking forward to all of you, um, you know, whoever's interested in and you know having one-on-one -on -one work to do these um, you know free online um, coaching sessions because really really unexpectedly um, personal and cool like wait till you see them that it's just it's it is nice it's a nice format so anyway 